All right, well, thank you so much uh, for having me, and thanks for the invite, Noah. I appreciate the opportunity to meet with you all. Um, as Noah mentioned, I'm pretty new here to Boulder. I came, kind of arrived last fall from Tucson, from the U of A. And um, one of the, the directions that we're hoping to do with science discovery is more tightly connect science discovery to CU in terms of integrating more tightly with the research that's happening here on campus in terms of the science the science as well as the education research. And um, for I think for a lot of years, as Noah mentioned, science discovery has been around a long time. We were founded in 1983. So we've been around offering programs for quite a while. And I think for a number of those years, science discovery operated somewhat like its own organization, almost separate from CU. And so we're now really trying to bring our programs much more um, close to, to what's happening here on campus in terms of integrating CU students in the delivery of our programs, the development of our programs, um, and the evaluation of our programs. So um, just to in give you a little bit of background about me, I'm actually a biologist by training. I'm not an education researcher. So my PhD is in ecology and evolutionary biology. I taught biology at the college level for a few years um, at a small college in New England before going back to the U of A um, to direct outreach for an interdisciplinary bioscience institute at U of A, um, essentially the equivalent of the Colorado Initiative in Molecular Biotechnology, if you're familiar with that um, initiative here on campus. So um, I worked there for about six years doing, um, doing outreach with more of a, a bioscience, biotech focus. We um, developed a new GK12 program, which is about to enter its final year next year. Um, and so, so ran a lot of programs in terms of teacher professional development, on-campus field trips, in-classroom support of teachers, uh, but all with a biology focus. And I think one of the um, big differences between what I was doing at Arizona and, and science discovery, for those of you, actually, I should ask, how many of you are, or what kind of familiarity do most of you have with science discovery? Have any of you worked with the program or... Okay, so some of you are familiar. Well, how many, how many, of, you, how many of you have heard of science discovery? How many of you worked with science discovery? Okay, so a couple. Have any had kids or know of people who just kids who participated in our programs? A couple. Okay. Um, well, for many of our programs are fee-based programs. Science discovery started out by offering camps and classes for kids who would, you know, parents would sign them up and, and pay for them to go, and so. Um, that's still a big part of what we do. We do these fee-based, week-long um, classes during the summer, as well as overnight camps out in the field throughout the state and to a few other nearby states. Um, and, and so one of our, our goals as we um, move forward is to um, look at what we can do to really broaden access to our program so that we're not just hitting the kids who already have an interest in science and whose parents can afford to send them to our summer programs. Um, so I, we, we are much more than our summer programs. I think that's what most people know us for. So I kind of outlined some of our programs. I didn't make enough copies. I didn't, you guys are Nobody an impressive size group. <laughs> hadn't, hadn't realized. So we share. Have to, we share have to well. share with your neighbor. Um, but I, I thought I would just give you an, an overview of our core programs, tell you a little bit about where we're hoping to go as we go forward. And I, I really see a lot of opportunities for us to connect to education researchers on campus. I think um, as I'm, we've been around for over 20 years and for a number of those years we actually have some, we have data that's been collected, we have evaluations that have been collected and for the most part they have just been sitting there. Um, we have a lot of anecdotal evidence of um, parents who come back, you know, whose kids went to science discovery for years and they're now you know, getting their PhD in astrophysics at Stanford or whatever the case might be. Um, but we don't have, I think there's the potential to look at some long-term effects of informal science education experiences, but no one has necessarily had the time to really look into what's there and, and see um, what's there. So that's just a, a thought. But um, just to give you kind of the, the big overview, the bulk of our programming, as I mentioned, are these classes that we do. Um, we do week-long summer classes throughout the summer, so actually our training starts next week. The classes start the following week right after Memorial Day and then we'll run through July. So it's a pretty busy time of year for us um, right now. 
These have typically um, hit kids ages 4 through 16. We're trying now to offer some more programs for some older students as well, so we don't lose them in those last two years before they're ready to um, come to college. They cover a whole range of disciplines, so this is another kind of fun part for me as well. I'm used to working in biology outreach. I'm a biologist by training, but this is, we cover everything, physics, earth science, geology. We're um, pretty much across the board. We have a whole range of programs, um, and actually I can, I have some catalogs I can distribute as well so you can get a sense of what we offer. Um, and then a, a smaller program, we offer these classes as well throughout the year in an after school format as well. And combined, those are reaching over 2,000 students um, during the year participating in these more in-depth classes. And um, what we've started to do, I think initially these classes were held throughout the community. They were held on, at, on school grounds. A few years ago, they made the move to bring most, the bulk of the classes here on campus to give students the experience of what CU is about. Um, we want to expose them to the campus. We want to bring them into the labs. And we really want to connect them with undergrads and grads here on campus. So traditionally, most of the classes were taught by um, in-service or retired teachers. We still have some of those in our instructor pool. but. Um, Increasingly, the instructors of our classes are science graduate students from a whole range of departments. So that's been exciting. I don't know, I know some of you have worked with Barbara Monday, our class program director. She's really done a tremendous job of connecting with a lot of different departments on campus to bring graduate students um, into those programs. So that's been fun. Um, as I mentioned, for the most part, these classes are, are fee-based. Um, they're not inexpensive, but we've been really, I think, have done a good job over the past couple of years of increasing the number of scholarship opportunities we have for students. So one of the, um, a nice partnership with a number of faculty has involved um, collaborating with faculty who might you know, want to connect with us as part of achieving their broader impact sections of a grant, or they have a, a more substantial outreach need for, for some funding that they have. Um, we've been developing classes in collaboration with them and their graduate students. They're typically taught by their graduate students. And then it, it's a really nice win-win because we can um, either work with groups in the community to bring groups of students on campus um, or just scholarship a large number of slots for those classes. Um, so we're doing classes like that <coughs> through partnerships with the Institute of Behavioral Genetics um, with an engineering professor. We have an electromagnetism class. We're doing a um, class with the Environmental Center this summer where kids are going to come on campus and it's a, they're learning how to upcycle surplus <coughs> computers. So they're essentially going to be rebuilding old computers and then they get to take the computers with them when, they, when the class ends. So it's a bit of a technology class and um, they get to go home with a computer, which is nice. Um, Criticals? Um, yeah, that's a quick question. What kind of... Um, I mean, do you have training like for those grad students that are coming out of these departments, or how exactly is it that they learn how to teach? They do go through. They go through some training with Barbara, um, but it is you know a number of the a number of the graduate students I think that she started with were involved in some of the um, teaching programs on campus. So a few of the GK12 programs were the the first sources I think of graduate students, which was a really nice way to begin because they were getting some of that teaching training through those programs. Um, I think it's, it's definitely an area that we need to um, increase the consistency of because I think as, as she brought in those opportunities for graduate students to get involved, some are coming in with a lot of experience and others are coming in with, um, with less teaching experience. So she works with them in developing and designing the curriculum for the class. Um, and then they have some training uh, before the summer class session begins. But I think it's certainly an area that, could, that we could grow. <clears throat> when, when just to play on that a little bit, I mean, one great opportunity, again, to think about institutional structures and bringing science discovery yet more on campus, which I love that the kids are here. I think it's really important for them. I think it's important <coughs> for campus. Um, let's work on a way to get those graduate students and undergrads who are participating. You know, LAs do it, CU so teach students do it. Let's get them credit. 
let's figure out how to build into the institutional structure of the education of those students these very educational practices, and then we can sort of tie that with um, professional development of current and future teachers along the way. Mm -hmm. Simultaneously, just to mm -hmm. continue on that line, um, both Kara and Ben are looking at the development of TAs as a function of practicing in the classroom. Why not, and we've done this through the PISEC program, is to look at the development of the educators through these experiences by working with children. Mm -hmm. Particularly, I just quoted, interestingly enough, to Stephanie, is a uh, CRPA, whatever it is, communicating uh, research and professional activities to the public or something like that, that NSF is really hot on. Let's build on that as an opportunity for thinking about, um, you know, developing communication skills among the grads and undergrads mm -hmm. who participate in this and getting NSF to pay for all that. Anyway, that's the but kind of thing. Ultimately, like, it would be it, it good, sorry, you know, and I can call you. Um, like, to, like, I, like, one of my goals, dreams, is to have it, the science discovery and other informal science education experiences built into the teacher certification program so it is one of the practica that they are required to take a course that's associated. It, it's like the LA program yeah. where this is their practicum and it's directly linked. It would be a more meaningful, I think, program if we could ever... Yeah, no, these are exactly the kinds of things that we want to develop. And I think what's exciting is we have, you know, after having been around for so long and been doing these programs for so long, we, we have a lot already in place in terms of mm -hmm having both partnerships with schools, but also having a lot of, I mean, we have a whole huge shed that we rent that is filled with, you know, materials and supplies that we have used for activities from, you know, in all of these areas. So um, there's something really exciting, I think, that, you know, if we have one of our programs, for example, our Science from CU program is a program that offers essentially classroom presentations and hands-on workshops in classes to schools wherever. I mean, most are obviously Denver, Front Range area, but it has the capability of going statewide. And yet for that program, essentially we have, we have these workshops that are developed. We hire, we essentially outsource a lot. We hire these instructors. We send them out when teachers give us requests and, and they deliver these programs. Um, so it's kind of a you know, one-off experience for the students who are receiving it. And I think, you know, there's something, there are some positive things about it, but I would love to see um, I, you know, I think that program in particular could be married with a, a class or a practicum experience. You, have to pay them. you shouldn't have to pay them. It should be a part of the gig. Exactly. Their education. Exactly. I and question so, question about support. Sorry, mm -hmm. I came in late, so forgive me if you've already addressed this. Are you entirely self-sustaining, or do you get any support from CU? Good question. <laughs> we we right. We're not entirely self-sustaining, although that is the that is the goal. Until recently, we've been a part of the School of Education. Um, I, about maybe two years ago, a year and a half ago, the School of Ed and the Division of Continuing Education came to an agreement, and we shifted over to the Division of Continuing Education. So we report to Dean Hines of Continuing Ed, and um, she also oversees, as part of her umbrella, which is a pretty large one at this point, she oversees outreach and engagement for the university. So we're a nice kind of component of that as well. Um, and so we do receive quite a bit of support from continuing it at this point. In terms of some of their infrastructure, we work with their marketing personnel, their accounting personnel, so some of their staff, but we also receive some um, financial support. Um, that said, for the amount of um, personnel that we hire and the amount of outreach that we do in a given year, it's not that much. I mean, we actually cover a lot of our, um, the majority of our costs. And the, the summer camps more than pay for themselves. They're oh, a revenue yes. generator yes. for the rest of science discovery and help it work. Exactly. And then there's also this idea of this model for it to, uh, science discovery to partner with research grants to support the educational components of them. So we're always thinking about creative ways to set up partnerships, the idea of creating courses, you know, and integrate that would also then provide staff. So ultimately this is, but the university must, and one thing is, I mean, you know, I really like the idea that the university creates infrastructure for staff time to say that's part of what we do and who we are, mm -hmm. so that it's always there. Um, I was just say something else to what you were just saying. Um, you know, I, well, I think as part of 
you know, with our move to continuing ed, because their, so, and, and their piece of outreach and engagement, their mission is really about connecting CU faculty to the Colorado community. That's what their, their um, focus is. And so that's a big part of our push to really uh, become more aligned with that, with that mission. So looking increasingly at how we can use our programs as a vehicle for getting CU research out to the community. Um, and I think, you know, the grant support we have is fairly um, substantial. So we're tying into um, some large grants, some large NSF grants, for example, that are supporting a number of our programs. Um, and then we have a whole range of, um, of smaller grants that provide either scholarship support or help to, you know, defray the expenses of some of the programs. So um, I think the more we can do that, obviously, the better. I think it can, in, in a lot of cases, it really does work out to be a nice win-win partnership for the faculty because we're not, they're not being asked for, um, you know, to create something new that they're not, that they don't have experience in doing, but they can tie their expertise to our infrastructure and they can provide their students with some really interesting teaching opportunities. Um, but again, we, we are, um, we do pay a lot of instructors outside of CU, and, and that's something that I would really like to move more in the direction of working with undergraduate and graduate students, either through classes um, or, or just you know, increasing more students, uh, the number of students who are working in the programs. Um, and, and some of our programs have been doing that already. So for example, CU Teach program, we are working um, quite closely with, as you know, um, involved a number of CU Teach students in our summer program. Um, I think the new, the new combo class this summer, um, they're actually going to be observed in the, in their oh, classes, in their right? Oh, in instruction with, oh wow, see that's beautiful. So I think um, for that, you know, we've wor worked with CU Teach before involving CU Teach students in the, in the programming um, and the, the salary for those students has been split between the two organizations. Um, one of my graphs with and science discovery, but the idea is that we get them in the freshmen and sophomores and we kind of keep them in the pipeline of interest in teaching. And science discovery turns people on to teaching, right. and then we get to keep them mentoring with the noise fellows. And the flip side is, right, the LAs um, are great teachers. They're, they're the ones who've gone mm -hmm. through sort of long standing practices and so know how to engage, in fact. And A, and it's great for recruiting then those LAs into the teacher search program because this is the first time that LAs are really getting to work with the kids that they had identified with teaching from the get-go. But most of those aren't LAs, so some right. of them that they're really no. getting. But this right. is, yeah. I'd like them to be. But, you know, it's, it's been great hearing from some of the CU Teach students who, for example, have worked on our Wilderness Camp program. I mean, it's such a different teaching experience for them, very different from what they're seeing in the classroom, but it's really... It really hooks them. I mean, it's you know seeing another, experiencing another side of teaching that I think has um, a huge impact on them. So I think there's a lot of potential there for, and you know, we love getting them into our program because obviously they're getting some training in teaching. Um, but I think it, it also works for you guys to have them kind of it's get really that critical. energized it's experience. So the more that we can you know do that, the better. And I think um, we're not you know right now. I don't know if you guys are looking at it more quantitatively, we haven't been, we've just kind of been hearing anecdotally, you know, what these, ex the impact that these experiences have on the education students. Um, but we haven't been doing any kind of research on that, and, and one, one reason I wanted to connect with, um, you know, this group and with, with Noah and Valerie is, you know, thinking about, we're about to head into this summer, where we have 2,000 students coming through, through our classes, you know, are there, um, you know, is there data that we want to collect this summer as kind of baseline data or preliminary data that we could then um, would want to use for looking at future funding opportunities? Um. Yeah, data <laughs> we, we need to get on that. Um, well, let, can I pause there? Yeah. I mean, so, and we'll just sort of open this up. So, it strikes me that there is an opportunity to look at what's the impact of this on children. Mm -hmm. There's the opportunity for this to look at what's the impact on the teachers or the university students and the other, the broader teaching pool. Um, there's the opportunity, I haven't figured out exactly how to look at this, but about the institutional structures. How does the university itself identify with this and, and science discovery, as well as 
formal school systems or not um, along the way. Each one of those, and we've chatted about that a little bit in other informal science discussions we've had here, each one of those populations, you'll have the opportunity to collect different kinds of data. What would be important to you, and what do we think we have in the way of resources here? What, what kinds of data sets do we think would be easy and useful to obtain? Or is that not a reasonable question to ask? No, right no, now? no, that's a great question. Um, Let me start with you. What, yeah. which, which populations do you care about most, or do you think matter most? Or um, I mean, I, I think our, you know, in the past, the focus has pretty much solely been on the kids. What is the impact on, you know, on these kinds of experiences for the kids? And I can actually, I'll pass this around um, again. Mm -hmm. This is um, kind of the evaluations. This one with the low, the. This landscape one is one that uh, was developed by a School of Ed grad student a few years ago, used in the after school program. And then the, um, portrait. the portrait one is one that has been used more recently in the summer program. Um, again, they've solely looked at impact of the experience on kids. And I think looking at, you know, looking at the teachers, I'm really um, just as interested in. I think from my experience working with GK-12 programs, and seeing the experience that those uh, classroom experiences have on science grad students has been really um, interesting to track. Um, and so that's a, hu and a huge area that we haven't even tapped into, but I think would be really great, um, great to do. And, and we're starting to move, as well, we do you know, a number of community programs and are starting to look at doing more family kinds of programs um, in the next couple of years. And so I think that's another area of focus for us. Mm -hmm. Is it? Okay. One of the issues that you guys can tell me what you think about, um, one of the issues I've always struggled with when I think about assessing the students in the informal science program is that we have a tendency to want to assess them on the basis of what we value from formal science education programs. And we're not even sure necessarily by virtue of informal what it designed to do. We know it does good stuff, but we don't exactly know, I mean, I don't exactly know what informal is designed to do. I mean, you know, we can get into like whether or not I understand what formal education is supposed to do either. But, um, but at least we know we assess content knowledge, right? And it's like, well, that's not what most for informal science textbooks are set up to establish. Right. And so the question is, what do you assess and how is that valued? It's a really, I don't know, question. Well, isn't that an NSF report that talks about it? I, the informal science program? Isn't that how we've got a lot of nice stuff about what the goals are of informal science? Do you know what, what I'm talking about? It's all beyond school. Oh, that, that um, NRC report. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. NRC. It talks about the six different strands, mm -hmm. four of which are the same mm -hmm. as the formal strands, good interestingly good enough. Framework. Good. Um, yeah. And I mean, it talks about enthusiasm and identity. I can pull up some of it. I mean, just looking at this, this looks like, you know, sort of vast boss, EVAPS class type stuff, which is um, a mix of nature of science, identity, and um, uh, affective interest. Oh, self-report, however. Right. Well, actually, I asked to describe their child's view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was gonna yeah it's, done, it's done with, it's, you know, given to kids who are old enough to do it themselves, if they're younger, you know, because we're working with some younger kids, too, who can't necessarily read this, <laughs> they tend to sit down with their parents and do it with their, with their parents. So, um, from what I hear, it's kind of a joint, you know, the, the kid's response um, via the parent. Do you have a list of your classes? Uh, yep. We have our catalog. You can take a look through. Um, actually... One thing I should say, so, you know, it's interesting because we have these different programs, and I, I can give you a quick overview of the others as well. Um, they're run by different directors, and um, they kind of have their own identity within science discovery as kind of these separate, uh, separate programs. So we're trying to bring some of that together under more of a joint kind of marketing effort so as not to confuse the, confuse the public. Um, 
let's see, I can, why don't I tell you a little bit about some of our other programs so we can, so you can have a full picture of what, what we do and then think about where some of your efforts might fit in. In addition to the classes, which are the bulk of our programming, um, we have a program called Science Explorers, which is a program during the school year that works with school groups. Um, it was designed as a professional development program, but where teachers would bring a few of their students so that they would have a chance to see how their students respond to the activities. Um, so typically a, a full day workshop will have about 20 teachers and 100 students or so. That group will rotate through three workshops that are all centered around a theme, and then that theme changes every year. Um, so this year the theme is Paleo Explorers. I think some of you have probably seen our dinosaur around town, either at some of the iSTEM events, um, okay or other community events, but this was in partnership with the CU Natural History Museum, working with a, a museum study, recent museum studies graduate. Um, he's a paleontologist, dinosaur guy, and we focused um, the program around his research. And that's been a big, um, big hit with the kids. They do a dinosaur building workshop where they're actually recreating a, an actual dinosaur skeleton. Um, they do some research on these microfossils that John does in his research to recreate um, where the ocean and, and estuary were. Um, and then they do a, a stream table kind of activity. Science Explorers. And next year, this program is going to be in conjunction with the NSF funded Critical Zone Observatory program. So, um, Again, a nice, a nice tie to a major research grant here at the university, um, which involves hydrology, stream ecology. We have grad students who are doing um, you know, snow hydrology and climate change, so there are a lot of possibilities for, um, for that program. Science from CU is the program that I mentioned that takes classroom presentations and workshops out to schools all over. And again, I think this, is, this has a lot of um, possibility, I think, for, in it, for tying more closely to an education class um, here on campus. And then we, we have a wilderness camp program as well that takes kids on like, week-long overnight expeditions um, around the state. We're doing a paleo expedition to John's field site in Wyoming this year. That's been a big sell. Um, a Pacific Northwest trip, and then one in New Mexico as well. So, Ooh, where are you going in New Mexico? So, oh, I'm not the one to ask. <laughs> where's, where's Dev? Uh, Dev is actually no longer with Science Discovery. Right. So, um, so this program will likely be kind of uh, morphing a little bit as we go forward. Again, becoming more of a field science program, connecting to field research projects here on campus. So that gives you a little bit of um, an idea of the breadth of the programs and the kinds of things um, that we do. But again, you know, research and looking at the impacts of these programs has been something that I think has been recognized as a need for the organization for a long time, but it's a need that hasn't yet really been met. So all of the programs, I think, do evaluations along these lines. Um, for the students that participate in the programs. Um, I think a lot of the evaluations are sitting in binders in offices and haven't, you know, they've, they've certainly looked at student input along the way to help improve programs as they're delivered, but um, haven't necessarily partnered tightly with education researchers to really look at um, informal science education. So I think there's a lot a lot there in terms of opportunities to involve students in the development of new programs and in the teaching of these programs, but also um, in looking at the impact of these programs <coughs> on a number of audiences. So. What's a typical class size? Typical class size is 15 students, 12 to 15. Um, oh, another, one other piece I wanted to mention relative to our classes. Um, in addition to some of these grant-funded classes that have arisen through fa partnerships with faculty, we are um, in our first year of a five-year partnership with BVSD through their 21st Century Learning Center grant um, through CDE. And so this is providing a whole range of programming um, after school, during the school year, as well as during the summer to um, 
low-income minority students at three schools, Columbine being one, um, Columbine the school that Noah mentioned earlier, Uni Hill, and Casey Middle School. So we have two elementary and a middle school um, where we have a significant amount of funding to run after-school programming um, that I think is also really ripe for um, a student who might be interested in researching, you know, how do we engage these populations in science. So do you build, the, the, the issue really is funding for the doc student, which it would be like a two year or two year project, and they would need to be funded in order to do that work, and it's difficult for other grants to say, oh, I can release them from this thing that I said that the NSF I'd be doing to do this other work. Right. So like BDSP or, or whoever wrote that has to build in the funding for the doc student, and then we can find interested doc students, but it, otherwise it's, it's a challenge to, so there's another way to go about it, just for the record, which is that we, on this end, say, wait a sec, we've got this tremendous infrastructure here for which we have as a, as a research platform, and we can proactively go out and ask for uh, research money from but the informal space. But we need to do that. We right, need to exactly. ask for the, the funds right. have to be Well, which is hardly what we're doing sort of here. Right, which is to say, what is it that we would need? If we wanted to get, do we want to get in this game? What kinds of questions would we want to ask if we got in this game? And what would we need in order to do it? So I put in for ISC grants before, for instance. We haven't won them, despite having brilliant language about what it is that we're going to do. Um, so I have to simplify it, of course, yeah. so that the reviewers can read it. Um, I'm kidding. But anyway, so this is, this is one part where we discuss it. So this is exactly right. Like, there's a chicken egg thing here, too, partly, right? Well, and I didn't know with the, that announcement about the iSTEM graduate right. fellow awards. I mean, there is that go. something that would be, you know, but it would we be in a position to co-host a graduate yeah. student, either from physics or from education, who might be interested in, in doing research in this area where we could open our programs up um, to them through that kind of funding? Absolutely. Especially if we had matching funding, which is what that program asks for. But, um, and longer term, it just seems to me that a semester ain't gonna, it is not enough no, to no, do no. this research. You need a year and a half to two years, and you need somebody who's going to commit to the mentoring of this research for the student as well. And, and I'm that definitely, you know, we've got plenty of folk in the School of Ed, and certainly in physics and probably in other departments who are interested in this kind of work. But, yeah, funding and mentoring. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I get, you know, I, I feel like to be competitive for any substantial funding that would enable us to support a grad student for several years, because I agree. I mean, I think yeah. it has to be a awesome. multi-year project, and it would be really nice to have funding that would enable that continuity. But to get to that point, we need some, I think, some early, early data that we can initially you know, That's a great point. be more competitive. So that's why I'm here, <laughs> to, to kind of rein in assistance with that, given that you know, we have um, you know, these programs, particularly for this summer, that are getting ready to, um, to launch. You know, so knowing I'll... that you know, this is essentially this is what we have right now. Um, where can we go from here in order to put us in a, in a more competitive position for right. an IC? So. Uh, just looking at this, I think, you know, these are nice questions, uh, this sort of staple, um, which is good, and, and things that we care about. It's hard to know, to see from this, well, two challenges that I see immediately from this as a survey question. One is, it's hard to know what the impact of science discovery is uh, as a result of this. So these are given presumably at the end. Right. So you don't know where people were at the beginning. Or, so if you do see, you know, sort of, Let's say you did a sample of the population and found that they were whatever the mean was, and these students were then differentially higher. That's one way of saying, aha, potential impact. Or there's a selection effect, selection bias that's going on. Of course. On. So there is some question by which can you embed pre-post into this, which is one classic tool, to give this as part of the class activities embedded within this, not as a sort of survey that stands out apart from everything, but embedded in the activities so that they start by beginning and see if those, these, some of these kinds of questions or forms of identity do shift through participating 
in this community. So that's one thing is to consider. And then the other that we've had tremendous challenges with is seeing age variation. So these kinds of questions may read well for late middle high school students, maybe, but certainly not for elementary students. As you said, so you have parents read it. Now there's a real question about how do I interpret who's answering this question um, and in what way. So we have some success at doing some of that and have shifted some of these around. So Kara, you've worked on some of this. Um, middle school, is that right? No? Do I have this wrong? And then we've also done some in the you know, PISEC program. validated or done, but can give us some sort of inclination as to what it is, what thread we might want to pull on. So another thing is, in our eight-week um, PISEC programs, we don't see impact on most of these questions. Well, look, can I ask you, what do, but, you, well, what do you think impact, what impact do you think science discovery is having that could be potentially measured in the summer? Well, and again, we're get, I mean, the discussion is getting back to this, getting back to kids, and, and that might not be necessarily where we would want to focus. I mean, I think one of the things that is exciting and interesting to me is how we have been integrating more students into this and the fact that we're tying into the training that you're doing. The CU teachers. The CU teach students. Um, I think there's some interesting potential, potential there, and that might be more of the direction where... Um, we want to go. Where I mean, I think funding can assist. What's that? We're seeing teach funding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and PISEC can partner. This is what we've been looking at, find really some low-hanging fruit that, A, helps with, one thing that we can claim is these programs are good for kids and nobody's going to dispute us. Flip side is, I, I don't know, not to be too glib about it, it's not entirely clear that people care. Right? So, which is, People vote with their feet and parents send their kids to these programs or they don't and that's what happens. But if we could demonstrate that this is a positive program for university students, now all of a sudden I, I see three populations that would really potentially care. One is the university administration to say, aha, this is the experiential based learning program that we've been looking for that partners with Flagship 2030 that builds on say the LA model or um, other things or is, is another avenue for this. So the university administration we can go and demonstrate, aha, this is a good thing. Potentially the students themselves, so that you can share. I mean, if you have, a, we've pulled out snippets from students that say things like, teaching this summer camp was the most powerful experience for me as a future educator that I've had in my life. All right? Anecdote on the one hand, incredibly great sales pitch on another. Right? And, you know, great data. That, you know, you change one person, you save the whole world. So, um, a few are. Um, so, um, and then the third, so I mean the point is, is the students. And then the third population that we could consider collecting those data for would be for funders, and particularly at NSF. And we would follow the lines of saying, all right, you want to make science accessible and you want to make future scientists better able to communicate about scientific language. You want to um, be able to reach and, and translate some of the leading research that's going on here at the university. Then you're relying on those students who have had an experience teaching in science discovery. We can demonstrate those students are better at communicating about their ideas than they were before. That would be powerful to me. I mean, I, I think in terms of what we can collect this summer, I think I, I'm a little bit more interested in in that in terms of looking at the impacts on the educators, on the on the university students, in part because of the self-selection that we already have in terms of the students coming in here. So, it, you know, I, I think in terms of the K-12 students participating in our programs. I'm 
interested to see the effects of science discovery as an intervention for students who are not self-selecting to come to our programs, but who are receiving our programs through, you know, at their schools. I think that there's a lot of potential there. So, you know, for the school year CLC programming, I think there's a lot of interesting potential. Um, but I think for the summer, if that makes sense, you know, I think because the students that we're getting here, for the most part, with the exception of a few um, classes that are that are grant funded or that we're doing with the CLC project, you know, these are students who a lot of them have parents who are scientists. They're interested in science already. They're and from they fairly wealthy families. Well exactly. I mean, that's that's who the majority of students coming to the summer programs are. So we have and we have great stories about. You know, kids who have gone through our programs have come back as TAs and come back as instructors. So we have some great anecdotal stories. But I think, in terms of where the um, where our main research interests would be, would be on those kind of. Have you collected can we, any? Can we take a moment um, for people to talk in groups about the kind? I really want to hear more voices than my own email and and Stacy's. If if that's cool, because I think you guys probably all have ideas about what kind of data. Given that we're looking at this population of, of CU teachers, these are people who have only taken step one and step two. Or not even. Courses. Mostly haven't. Well, the ones we're hiring for science discovery have taken step one or step two. That's how we found them. Or they are in the pro I mean, the, so this summer they are in the process of doing the combo. Or they're class. brand new in the combo. Oh, my Or they're brand new in the combo. <laughs> or there are 50 graduate students. The bulk okay. of these people. So we have 80 um, participants, 30 of whom are undergraduates, some of whom are in CUT, some of whom aren't. Correct. And so, right. So I'm, I'm particularly interested in CUT, don't get me wrong, but those aren't the only participants. Okay. Graduates working well, in okay, given these two populations, graduate students, science majors, or math majors, science majors? The grad science students? Type, yeah. Yep, they're, I mean, okay. all across the board, yeah. And, um, and undergraduate students, such as those that might be coming out of CUT, but if they're taking step one, step two combo, you're right, they're LAs probably. Okay. What kind of data can we collect this summer where we can write a grant in the fall where we would have a grant proposal in the fall where we would have something interesting to say, right? Have you collected any data from these uh, teachers before? I don't think they have. Okay. Nope. Excellent. Then anything we do is positive, <laughs> except for the data that makes it negative. Up. <laughs> right.
coming across right. where you could observe, I mean, that we could collect data and bring it there, comfort in the classroom. Is there a response to the minor? Is there a legal issue? Is there an age that the instructor has to be? Every class has a new instructor. That's a grad, I mean, I don't think there's a, in all cases, there are grad student or a teacher. And then a TA, typically an undergraduate. So each class has one of these. And the undergraduates, and they all go through the same background check and for state training. The instructors working on the camps go through a lot more scrutiny and background checks for that. And these are all daytime ones. No. Uh, well, the wilderness camps are open. Right, right. But well, the, the but classes are all day. Okay. And so there's a very standard, you know, teaching is a week long. The classes are either full day or they're 9 to 12, 1 to 4. Typically, parents drop them off in the morning and pick them up in the afternoon. Either day or afternoon. So we offer half day sessions, full day sessions, and then we have linking supervision so that if they sign up for two half day sessions, they can be there for one day. Our supervisor during that day. Lunch period and then after. Do you have any statistics on what fraction of the students are, you know, particularly local, older, long lines? How many, if any, come from afar? Um, I mean, most are most are local. We have some from further away. This summer we have um, a number. You know, there's some like the Linguistics Institute for the month, yeah. um, and they have put in our program as something for kids to do. Right. So we have kids um, all over. Enrolled. I know we have a woman, a girl from Paris taking a class because her parents, you know, kids who come with their parents to the in the summer. But for the most part, it's pretty and, uh, I'm just thinking of Boulder kids have so many opportunities. Pueblo kids don't. Exactly. Well, one class, the class that we're offering with, I mean, this is why we try to do more grant funded programs with faculty. The electromagnetism class, for example, that's with a professor in electrical engineering is working up with Eleanor in Trinidad. So those kids will be coming and they'll be staying overnight in the dorms for um, just continuing that class as part of what they do while they're in Boulder. Computers class um, that I mentioned that we're doing in conjunction with Odyssey and uh, the Environmental Center. They were hoping to bring a group from Denver again for a residential piece. I'm not sure if, um, if they've opted to go that route or if they've opted to go with a more local group. Same storm? Same storm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, oh, yeah, that's sure. where you'll make the impact. I mean, the, you know, exactly. the, the children of scientists are going to go to college. You um, can't stop them. <laughs> Sell them, do they get stopped? But that doesn't mean they can't be more positive. That's right, that's right. 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 That's
I probably should have clarified ahead of time. For the grad student population that we're working with, they are hired to teach, you know, obviously classes in their area of expertise. So they might be teaching one or a few classes during the summer. The undergraduate students we're working with, they're hired to work through the summer. So because they're serving as TAs, they might be put in a number of class, number of different classes in a support role. Um, but the nice thing there is we do have students that you know, it's not like they're just getting a week-long experience. They're getting nine weeks, you know, in this classroom setting. So, for what that's worth. Anyone? The things that we think that you probably would be unlikely to detect a signal on would be improvements in teacher quality. Um, the student affect thing is highly problematic because of selection. And the fact that if you're going to retrospectively look at this survey data, there's serious problems with preparing the students getting I think the thing that we... You're such an academic, Mike. The thing that we think that you probably might be able to detect is changes in um, undergraduates and graduate students affect towards teaching that would be possible. And I think that we agree that What was it? Of whether or not that they feel they're more prepared or less prepared to teach. Oh, yeah. Prepared to what? Before they start. Before they start. Like a pre oh, wow. survey. Right, right. The problem is some people don't know until several years into teaching exactly how no, much they don't know. Right, right. Well, if it goes down, maybe that's a good sign. Right. right. That, that was part of the discussion. That yeah. the that's what we were talking about. Uh, we're suggesting that you get in touch with some of your C, CU Teach alumni and ask them about, you know, now that they've been in the classroom for a couple of years, what are some of the things that they wish they'd known more about coming out? And then create a survey about, you know, I am comfortable with, you know, classroom management or dealing with absenteeism or whatever issues get raised and give that as a pre and post. Because I think the advantage of having these practicums is making potential teachers aware of what teaching is really like so that when they get to, you know, the theory courses, the pedagogy courses, they're ready for <coughs> Right. In fact, we kind of teach in the wrong order. But well, no, so let they me just... have practica associated with all the methods courses. They have practica, but they're in formal environments. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but let's. How would this informal exactly. environment affect readiness for formal environments? Well, and it's uh, very few of these teachers, I think, are um, uh, teacher cert candidates yet, I bet, we could sort of survey them. But can I summarize this, though, just by way of concretizing the questions? Um, could you imagine asking a question, how compli complex is teaching? I mean, some way to actually quantify that so that it's a reasonable thing. And then say, how well prepared are you to teach in advance and later? And if you ask those two questions, where there's conceptions of the difficulty of teaching and then how well prepared are you, you could imagine seeing, teasing out what Kara was suggesting, which is to say, um, am I prepared to do it? Now, all of a sudden, you can understand maybe it'll go down because they're more aware of how complicated it is. I think you also want to ask, like, if you're doing it as a recruiting tool, how interested are you in career teaching? Yes, what's your identity as a teacher? 
Right, or how interesting. And I would love some qualitative data on, you know, hey, what do you think it means to teach? Right. <laughs> That's we thought of something similar was assessing, particularly for graduate students, assessing uh, students, assessing their attitudes and beliefs about teaching, uh, either with a survey, pre-post survey, or or and or with interviews, and comparing comparing the impact of formal education experience with informal science education experience on their attitudes and beliefs as measured with the same. And then, and then I think, because we could do it with both and Valerie, sides. Valerie already has the title for the grant. Oh my gosh, what was it? <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but we could do it with both populations, because the graduate yeah. students, we could do, you know, we could do a pre-post after their TA, TA experience and compare it with their informal experience. What I think we'll end up learning, especially if we have long answers, is kind of like, what are the different things that can be gleaned from these two different types of experiences? And with the CUTH students, we got surveys that we've been giving them pre-post out of the mothership, out of the, the YouTube. <laughs> They've been giving them pre-post after step one and step two, and we give them the same survey, only in step one, step two combo informal, you know. Well, that would be the, uh, you know, to start with somebody else's survey so we could have comparative data mm -hmm. on that would be great. Another, thing, like. yep. another uh, thing you could use is our top of the graduate folks, you know, what are they like prior to this informal experience and how does the non-integrated, less threatening environment mm -hmm. affect their performance in the more formal environment? Right. Our top's expensive, it's the only downside, I totally agree with you. Yeah. Well, it's just not designed for informal settings. No, 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 but you, Rich was suggesting you, you are taught them in the university. No, I, well, our top itself is a problem outside the form. Oh, well, we can talk about that. But I think that, I mean, in terms of looking at what our top is measuring, experiences in informal science education, you would expect would be developing those kinds of traits in teachers. So that could be an interesting thing to look at. I had some. Please share. So start with, have you taught before and where, right? To get some, some background on where is it that, you know, what experiences do they have from everybody. Try and identify, hone in on what is their present identity as a teacher and what's their present identity as a scientist. Um, what do they believe their, the role of scientists, the roles of scientists in teaching? are, then their conceptions of teaching, many of which we sort of touched on, um, but, and, and so we would draw on some of those others. One thing that I think would really be interesting is to try and look at what they believe the nature of students to be and capacity of students to be. Um, uh, I think that's going to radically change as a result of participating in these environments and depending on the population. I like the idea of giving an example, asking, as I think you had suggested the idea of, of collecting um, uh, uh, qualitative data, Kara. I mean, asking a specific question and saying, give an example of this, and having people write about it would be really interesting. Because I think the examples people draw from would potentially change dramatically. And can't underestimate how important those anchor experiences are for folks. And that's it, though, that would be, I'm sorry. No, that's right. Just interesting to know, like what we I've seen before is um, when when they're working in the science discovery and formal environment, their teaching is significantly different. When they're suddenly in the university environment with university students, they start behaving in this very strange way that looks a lot like the way university instruction takes place. Right. Whereas in their si in their informal environment, they are doing what would be considered reform-based teaching. 
And it's like, what is it that causes you to snap back into formal didactic methods? Context. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> data to support that claim. Yes. I think that's exactly right. What is their, I mean, what are their views on interactivity, flexibility, pedagogical content knowledge? I mean, the, many of these must have survey questions that are around it that we could draw from, from other instruments um, around that way, and then giving examples of that. I think actually, the problem is, you know, you could have an enormously long thing. I found it very effective in the past to ask people to reflect on it, either to project forward, what do you anticipate coming out of this experience, or reflect back on it, what is it that you did get out of this experience? This is another thing to, to in, in the sort of transfer literature, instead of looking solely for what is it that we expect to transfer or to happen in these environments, we can ask people what it is that they actually did and they found um, in this environment to see what it is. And I, I think there would be some really rich stuff coming out of those um, opportunities. And I would love to, to look at the impact of these on students' communication skills. Um, but, you know, and so we could, one option is then to go through this whole list and, and to keep adding to this list and then figure out what's practical or simple to do. What do you see as parallel, uh, Melissa, from your faculty studies? That would be useful here. I can put you on the spot. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, I'd have to give it a little bit of thought. I mean, nothing has particularly stood out to me that I've seen here thinking about. Okay. Other ideas? So the easiest, the, the easiest would be to do that CC survey. You know, but have you heard it one? Yeah, I, I don't remember all that. But there's, there's like a lot of stuff about that. Yeah, and we've got data from three years back. That's so awesome, though. Environment that we just peeled this up, and we probably have some data from the Kaiset class that we ran, and so we can. Um, yeah, we do have Pisec data. Let me be concrete about this. Would anybody be interested in having a lunch working meeting to review what it is that could go in on one of these? On one of what? Survey that we give to instructors before and after. Are, are, all, the, are all the perks tied up? Oh, you mean like now? Not like right now. Are I mean, the PR groups tied up? No. We could have another working meeting coming back if you want. It's four Rich? Yeah. Right on. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 if we already have an existing survey that you've already used with students going through the formal setting, I think it'd be a great start to do that with the Valerie, can you send me and Stacy that survey? I'll add to it with the PISEC materials that we have, and if anybody else wants the feedback, or we'll spend part of a, a group meeting going over that. Yeah, I need to dig. I have no idea where it lives. So well, I just ask Craig or somebody. That's yeah, their job. Yeah, but let me just put that on my thing. To do it. Yeah. And let's start with the super easy stuff. Stuff we already have. Yeah. Stacy, I have a question about the last bullet point on your graduate students as guest scientists. Could you give a segment of graduate students who are communicating specifically about their own research, or is this, uh, okay. Yes, so, um, kind of varies, but again, this is a program that historically has been kind of separate from CU Research, just right. doing really cool adventure camp type right. programming. Um, but with our kind of new alignment and you know, with, with CU, um, that's been an increasing focus of the program. So, for example, you know, in a program that might take kids up to Rocky Mountain National Park, now a, now a centerpiece of it is a grad student who does her research up there. Right. Um, the, the paleo program that's going out to the field site in Wyoming, it's all about his research. I mean, the right. kids are going to be in the field collecting data related to his program. So both the, the camp programs, which are these multi-day experiences, as well as some of the short-term um, outdoor classroom programs that aren't, you know, the class, the camps are things that a, a kid would just sign up for on their own. The outdoor classroom has been working with school groups 
Um, so for example, we took um, a lot of fifth graders, I think the whole fifth grade from Spangler Elementary in Longmont, up on three separate sessions up to the Mountain Research Station. Um, so they were up there with some of the grad students who are part of the CZO, and they would do um, field activities with them up in the field. And the Mountain Research Station, I should mention, is, an air, is a new, not new, but it's an area that we're also expanding our partnership um, with them because they are really interested in getting more K-12 students up there. Um, and we've, uh, we're hoping to launch a pilot program this summer um, as kind of a shift in what we've traditionally done for the wilderness camp programs. Working with, um, BVSD has a research seminar course where students, juniors and seniors, take a year-long research course where they work with a research mentor. So um, we're gonna work with that program. They have about 80 students at all the, you know, combined across the district taking a group of those students up for a week-long program at the Mountain Research Station where they'll be partnered with um, undergraduates in the REU program there to do a you know really short-term piece of a research project that the undergrad has been working on. Mm -hmm. And the idea there is to hopefully um, develop some connections between these high school students who are very motivated in science, are planning to do a year-long research project, connect them before that school year with some pro research projects that they might continue. So, I was curious. This might uh, this might be a tangential issue and not appropriate kind of a first pass this summer research. But I think uh, one particular area of study might be uh, graduate research who aren't you know may have less uh, experience in, in in teaching settings, but how they communicate their own research. Uh, graduate research have a tremendous amount of experience communicating to their peers and presenting at conferences mm -hmm. to those who are familiar with the language and have a common jargon, but how do they communicate with the public and specifically the public under age 13? Right, uh, right, right. So it might be another avenue. Yeah, no, I think, and that's an area that NSF is really interested in, although they just killed the GK-12 uh, program. Okay. But that was, that's really the focus of, G, you know, has been the focus of GK-12, right. is almost more of a focus on the grad students than on the kids and teachers that have exactly. been benefiting from the program. But I think that's a really, important point, and I think, um, yeah, that'd be a great thing to, for us to really increase our measurement of as we start doing more of this with grad students. And I think it also gets back to Valerie's question earlier, too, about what kind of training those grad students are, are, are getting before they're working with these groups. Yeah. So, um, one of the things that strikes me, and it's probably not helpful advice for getting another grant, um, but thinking back on my own experiences as a graduate student when I was involved in outreach um, and the students at that time, you know, so this was 15 or more years ago, that I happened to have just come across once they've grown up and talked to. Um, what it strikes me is that from both the student side and from my side as a graduate student involved, that we weren't aware at the time of the impact on it. You know, that it's not until 10 years later that you can look back on it and realize mm. what that actually did for you, right. um, and that it would be valuable if you could find people that who both the graduate students and the kids who have now grown up and completed college, mm -hmm. you know, who went through the program 10 years ago, and find out from them, looking back, what do they think yeah. the impact was. Because that's to me, at least for my own experiences, it was much, you know, when I, when I came across someone who has their PhD in physics now, and said, hey, when I was 12, this program that you ran made me want to go into physics. Mm -hmm. That's very powerful, as opposed to, you know, they fill out this survey and say, wow, that was awesome. Right, you know, right, right. You don't know what, what that does down the line. Yeah. yeah, no, I think, and again, because we have been around for so many years, I mean, we have the information. I mean, we know the class lists from years back. And so, you know, it's something that we've been receiving, you know, just kind of in a very passive way when we bump into parents or, actual, you know, past participants who say, oh, I love Junior Rockets, I, you know, I'm, or whatever the case might be, we know that there are those cases out there, but there hasn't been any focused effort on saying, hey, let's, you know, really kind of track down. So I think that would be a lot of fun to do, to tap into that. 
because I think it's something that every you know everybody involved in informal science and, and these kinds of outreach programs I think struggles with well what is the long term effect you know we all like to say that okay these programs that are happening in fourth grade are going to inspire all these kids to be scientists down the line but I think a lot of times you just don't know until mm -hmm. the years go by you know like it's only now looking back on that I can see how it influenced the path that I took and the choices that I made and how I developed as a teacher but at the time you know right I mean, at the time I thought we'd done a terrible job you know and I can't believe that that's just exhausted you know but then as you get you look back on it you can see where the benefit was you know it's funny I when I was at Arizona I had a program for undergraduate women getting them out doing outreach and and we did one event on a weekend and one girl's mom was in from out of town so she had come and this was somebody who at the time you know she just graduated with a huge kind of like the university medal for outstanding student I mean she's just phenomenal undergraduate doing all these research projects she's going on to get her doctorate at Stanford in biochemistry really impressive performance as an undergraduate and her mom said to me she said I still remember what triggered Sarah's interest in science and I was like really what she said in fourth grade she came home one day and she was so excited because her teacher had done a demo where they guessed the number of drops of water that could fit on a penny I mean just a very simple demo where you know surface tension of water but it made such an impact on her you know it's just great kind of hearing those stories of what what that trigger is so I think that'd be fun do you guys Sorry. have something on your website where people can just write in and be like hey 15 years ago I did this thing and I just wanted to share that with you guys well you know it's it's interesting we've talked with our um, you know, as I mentioned, we're part of Continuing Ed, and you may have seen their billboards around town, and they're, you know, they're on all the buses. They have this campaign, they call it the Dream Campaign, and their whole focus is, or, you know, the, the, this marketing campaign is kind of showing kids doing something, and then, you know, it's like, here's a little kid playing with a rocket, and then at age 25 going back to school for physics, or whatever the case might be, but we were saying to Ted, you know, we have so many examples of of that, you know, with our kids who kind of did these things when they were little and then went on to do it as they were grown up. So trying to collect, you know, some of those real stories. So, so far, as I mentioned, it's just been kind of a passive thing, but we are in the process right now of redoing our website, and that would be a, we were planning to in, um, incorporate, you know, kind of testimonials from people who were past participants, but it would be nice to have that be an interactive piece where people could send something in. Still a tough fun. claim to make, though. It's still, I still yeah. am struggling with, okay, what claim would you be making that would cause me to buy the product? Like, um, you know. That's, well, that's, because you're, that's because you're a scientist, not a marketer um, in this, which is testimonials no, are that, huge. that's exactly right. right. No, yes. testimonials are huge. I'm not disagreeing right. that. We're not talking about marketing. We're right. talking about data to support the claim that this program is useful for something. Right, exactly. And, and so that's what I'm saying about this particular data, which is wonderful for marketing. The question is, how do you make the claim that this program enhances the possibility that the person will go into science? How do you support? It's just a tough one. I'm just right. well, no, I, I completely agree, because especially because for so long it has been a self-selection. I mean, it really has right. just been kids who so sign up for these programs. Yeah. They can't get a poll, and then you have to turn kids away. They... Um, the reason yeah. I'm because the kids who turn away are in the same self-selected population, but they didn't like the case if that happened. Right, you can use that as a comparative nice. study. Right. Um, so if that happened, you could potentially keep track of those kids. Yeah, and that's make a comparison good. between how many actually went into science. Yeah, yeah. like even like if it, it could be really short term, it could be like how many science classes they did in high school. So you can keep track of the people who got in in the middle school. Well, it's probably not Except for the either. number of science classes. Well, I mean, I, you know, as there, I know there yeah. are parents out there. Okay, so I'm going to um, suggest we wrap up here. Um, Stacy and I will be continuing to sort of work on this, and, and we'll sort of draft a, a survey, especially if we get any existing materials that you know of that are out there, particularly the CU Teach Survey, that would be great. If you have ideas about studies, please funnel them through me um, and Stacy. We'll work on it and come back to this group and um, get your PER stamp of approval. Um, and if you want to be more involved in this project, of course, come chat with us about it. Um, this is the kind of thing where um, we will likely be working towards a, a proposal in the August time frame. Um, so 
uh, come chat with us along the way. Thank you very much, Stacey. Awesome. Stacey. Well, thanks so much.